Hey y'all, Trevor here with Right of the Leaf, and today is going to be a little bit of a different video. We hit 500 subs on YouTube, and I really want to say thank you and appreciate each and every one of you for helping us make this goal. But um, we're going to go ahead and dive into a little bit of my backstory, cover kind of what's built up to uh, who I am today and kind of the major factors along here. We're not going to be going into overly... Um, overwhelming details because there are some things that would have to be quite a heavy video on, in and of itself. We will plan for that in the future, but for the time being, let's dive into this one, you guys. We'll see you on the other side of my intro, and uh, we'll get a little bit more into uh, my backstory and uh, why I smoke. Cheers, and let's get into this, you guys. Hey guys, welcome back. And again, I can't believe that we've hit the 500 subs. I really want to thank you for um, helping us get to this point in um, in kind of the the adventure and the the journey that this page has become. And it started just as an idea for an Instagram page, and not really sure how I wanted to to go about it and, and turn it into the community that it is. Cause that's really what, what I want right of the leaf to be is, is a community with a bunch of um, other people, whether it's cannabis involved or just things involved within my other interests where people with the same mutual um, interests or just desire to see this, the other people succeed and benefit from, from the sharing of knowledge and stuff like that. That's, that's the, the biggest desire on why I started this, this venture and journey that we're on and, and to come up and hit 500 subs in a completely different fashion than I originally expected is, is fun. And it's, it's shown me just how, how much more versatile it's going to have to be for us to continue to grow and really enjoy this, this venture. So there's a lot that I've learned from this, but again, that's not what we're meant to be uh, talking about today. We're, uh, we're talking about the backstory, not leaping too far into the future. So let's actually dive into the backstory side of this. Um, so born in Alberta, grew up in Slave Lake, um, went to one of the smaller schools in, uh, in my community. Well, there's two options. I went to the smaller of the two, um, grew up relatively stable, comfortable, ch um, childhood, Played hockey competitively and swam competitively in the summer and was able to compete in school sports, do all that stuff growing up. Um, wasn't really very social, didn't really um, hang out with many people. Kelton was one of the few people that I uh, really developed um, a friendship with in school. Not necessarily um, like an incredibly close friendship, but one that's kind of butted into the the friendship that it is right now. And it's just continuing to grow as we both develop and uh, kind of go on our own ventures. Um, when I was 12, I started getting involved in, or 11 or 12, right around that time, I started getting involved in the local fire department. They had a junior firefighter program. And I was really interested in getting involved in, um, emer in the, the fire department, honestly, was not an interest I got or I... I really had until I showed up in the fire hall that first day. Like, honestly, I, I said this from the beginning, I threw on the bunker gear. I smelt the smell. Like it just, it felt right when I threw on the gear and still to this day, there's, there's that itching and that craving to get back into it. Um, but it's just a little bit of a different way that I'm trying to, um, to scratch that itch essentially. But, um, Went through a summer's worth. It would have been about 12 weeks worth of training with the fire department, with the junior firefighter program. There's a couple of wildfires that started around my community. And we were uh, the three or yeah, the three returning um, junior firefighters from my first year. So me and two other boys of the same age were called in to come and help prep for stuff because it was right around our community like impending burning down the houses and actually 
did end up going into the community and burning. I lost my house. So it burnt roughly 33%, I believe, is the uh, the the percentage that they go off of the community was uh, lost due to the wildfire. Um, if you guys want to dive into more research and really learn more details about it, um, just Slave Lake Wildfire should pull up all the information. Um, but involved in the fire department, went, spent some time there, did a lot of uh, work prepping, uh, ended up seeing the fire transition into town. Like it was not the uh, easiest of days that I've had. And um, after the loss of fire, there was definitely some stuff along there that I had to work through and kind of build back from uh, like rebuild my character almost after being just shocked and awe at the way that it was after um, the fire and having all that and, and wanting to stay and put in the work and actually um, be involved with the fire department and not being able to due to like, I was under the age 18. So I simply couldn't, um, stay because I wasn't the one to be able to make that decision. Although it was everything kicking and screaming to stay. Just like that is 100% my personality. Now, afterwards, it it just supported that, that feeling and that desire to be in first response and get involved in working in that industry. And honestly, there was a lot of that... Um, family mentality within the industry that really had me interested in getting involved. And that was one of the core reasons on why I got working first response in the, in the industry. And one of my maybe misconceptions of it as well, but I worked from then all the way up until I was, um, it would have been 16 and the uh, local fire department, thanks to a lot of um, the funds and grants and support, financial support that we got post-disaster, um, I was able to take a lot of my um, college-based trading through the fire department. Um, so I got the 1001, which is a professional firefighter, 1002 aerial. So I have the operations um, certification for an aerial truck driving and setting up and operating the ladder of an aerial truck. I also have my dangerous goods um, technician level or not technician operator level training. So the second of three um, levels within that training, I have a lot of first response training within the fire department. And then um, it would have been five, six years of actual training within the fire department for almost the entire almost year round of that training with the exception of maybe eight eight months and then the chunk after the fire after that it was continuous training all year round um just training with the regular firefighters and with the junior firefighters during the uh the time that they had just because we were involved in there and it was kind of the a, a, a way to appreciate the help that we put in too right and the desire that we still wanted to be involved in the department afterwards right um so from there that developed and i started to get um training and then the opportunity to take my emr which was my emergency medical responder training the first level to get um into ems so emergency me medical services here um like paramedicine along those lines I took my EMR at 16. I was able to complete it. I went and got board certified in my province. So the Alberta College of Paramedics is where I'd have to go and get tested and certified. I went and got certified and I carried, I was carrying my license from 17 to 18 that said no patient contact because I legally couldn't touch a patient with my EMR skills while I was working until I was 18. But as a good Samaritan, you're covered with the Good Samaritans Act. But that's a little bit of different legality, right? Um, now, once I turned 18 finish, and I was finished high school, I dove right into EMS. I started working almost... I was... I turned 18 in, at the end of March, and I was hired and working within EMS that October. Um, I did go through an EMT program that 
that summer and was hoping to be hired on as an EMT, but um, do you do some, like I have some IBS and some uh, GI based issues due to that and just overall stress. I wasn't um, able to complete the first program uh, and so it was a little bit of a, a health and, and on me too, just as just as e evenly on me as I would say on my health. And with that, and, and again, at this point, I still hadn't been introduced to cannabis. I was just starting to get involved and independent in the sense of of looking in and researching it. Um, so we go from there into working in the EMS that October. I work as an EMR all the way through until that spring where I'm accepted into another program and I go to EMT school through the summer practicum and within six months I'm a uh, I'm completed my EMT program and I'm waiting on my test results for the board certification to move up to the next level so it would be just it would be about a year and a half and just under a half, about a year and a quarter, I would say, me working as an EMR level, which is pretty well just ambulance driver and here's some aspirin. Like very, very basic level patient care. But still crucially important in uh, in the EMS and definitely underused in EMS, in my opinion. Um, but did work, and I worked up in Slave Lake. I worked up in the remote communities around Slave Lake. A lot of calls, not necessarily the easiest, not necessarily some of the worst that have been out there, but it's definitely not a uh, an easy profession to, to, to keep it light, you guys. But worked through EMS in Slave Lakes as a casual, ended up getting a full-time position right at the end of me having my EMR. So it was an EMR-based position, worked in there, ended up being able to transfer, transition into some temporary full-times as well as some other positions and eventually meeting um, my girlfriend at the time, not the missus, but um, the uh, my ex and ended up moving down to Provost for a full-time EMT position because I was just unable to get one up here. There's a lot of a lot of story that I could dive into there, but we're not gonna do that right this second. Another time, another video. Transition to Provost, worked there. I was there for from the August until the accident was in July. And honestly, you guys, uh, the accident. This was kind of a, a key key tone for me. But before we get into that, um, first experience smoking. This was kind of a, a big a big factor in how I decided to recover from the accident. And before I get into any details here, we'll go into and uh, tell you that story about uh, my first time smoking. So the December prior to the accident, I was in Jasper with my family, girlfriend at the time, and we had um, family dog. Brother's like, yeah, let's let's go take the dog for a walk. Let's or no, let's just go for a walk. So it's like, oh, yeah, okay. We we I wanted to go for a walk. We uh, we all ended up going for a walk. Um, and the six months building up to this, I'd been listening to a lot of Joe Rogan. I've been doing a lot of research and I started to build up a little bit of interest at the same. This was pre-legalization everyone. This is, this is five years ago. No, no, it's not. It hasn't been five years ago. I have to sit down and do the math. Honestly, you guys, I haven't all the years at this point have been, have been starting to, to jumble up a little bit, but, um, <coughs> Okay. Out in Jasper, went for a walk, starting to get interested and involved in the cannabis, and I've had a creeping suspicion that uh, my uh, younger sibling was maybe involved in the uh, the ability to acquire some ganja because with some discussions with my parents and just because I was living 
six hours away at the time, so it was just phone calls and any of that. And some of the comments that they were making, I thought that maybe they would be interested, that not interested, that he would be the best person to ask and uh, kind of talk about it, inquire about it. Well, lo and behold, we go on this uh, this this wander, this walkabout in Jasper, and uh, he just casually asks, "So, uh, want to smoke up?" And I just straight up, uh, and I just uh, honest, I <laughs> yeah, I've been, I was honestly gonna start asking about it. I was, I was kind of curious. I'm looking at it. So, pulls out his bud. Don't have a goddamn clue what it was. For some reason, I want to say Ghost Train Haze, but I can't remember to save my fucking life. It was, it was, it was a baggy of weed. Packed that sucker up, put it into a pipe, and I was an uncoordinated mother. I couldn't figure out how to work that pipe to save my life. Go ahead, walk a little bit further. Couldn't figure it out. We sit down. He rolls up a joint. We smoke a joint. We go back to. Uh, we're staying in a cabin actually in Jasper. They're the Bear Lodge cabins. Honestly, you guys, if you have the opportunity to go to Jasper and you want to stay in a cabin, they're open all year round. Go and check them out. Beautiful cabins. Beautiful cabins. Absolutely love staying there. We get back to the cabin. Not feeling anything. But it's the first well, okay, let's that's let's reword what I said. I'm not feeling high. I don't feel stoned. I'm not feeling anything along those lines. I've just got a nice relaxed experience but it's the first time that my stomach hasn't hurt me in years like i'm talking two to three solid years of my stomach not having grumbles or pains or just it, it was just blissfully numb crushed the spaghetti pie that my mom had made so it was a lasagna Styled dessert, spaghetti later on the bottom, layer of meat, cheese, crushed half of that pan. It wasn't giggly, wasn't high, anything along those lines, just felt so nice. Did end up smoking again one other time when we were up on the ski hill. Didn't really feel anything then. I felt a little bit of a head rush, kind of like I do with the, the first sativa bowl of the day where it's like, ah, just that little little smile, but that was it. That was all I had to smoke. And then I ended up ordering on a um, black market site at the time. I got some uh, like topical oil, some edible can, of, they were called can of caps, so they were like 10 milligrams, and then a uh, vape, like a 510 vape. And I'd smoke that vape. I wouldn't really feel anything. I feel a little bit of a rush, but it was a CBD dominant vape. And I got that because it, well, it was CBD dominant, not really going to get high. And I tried those capsules once. I There were 50 milligrams. I was just like, oh, I'll take all of them. I took all of them. And it was one of the few times that I woke up and I can actually remember waking up and being high. Um, I ended up waking up and I had to drive to get to, um, I can't remember exactly where I was driving to, but all I can remember is it was snowing, it was blizzarding, and it, it would just, driving on the straight road, it wasn't that I was phased out or anything like that it would just be the right music would tone it and it would just honestly feel like i'm going through warp speed like you, you just get that kind of that tunneling of the pressure in your head just that kind of wrap here and honestly i ha i stopped and got a coffee half a uh, half hour after i was on the road because we came through i came through the town got a coffee Pound that back and it was gone, like almost immediately. It was just a little bit of the hangover of that uh, that original night. It was, it was curious, you guys. It was quite curious of an experience for me. But that was it. I had a little bit in Jasper, those experience. That was all I had prior to my accident in July. Now, coming into July, it was very beginning of the, uh, of the month clear sunny day we're transferring a patient from small from provost community i was working in into camrose we're about 50 minutes outside of camrose and at highway speeds we rear end the pickup truck that slammed on its brakes to make a left turn this point partners trapped patients 
um, wasn't um, lying flat on his back. He was kind of rolled. So me being in the airway chair, so I'd be sitting right at his head of the of the cot. Um, when the accident happened, I rocked back in the chair and the patient slid up the cot through the shoulder straps and onto my lap. I caught him in a bear hug. Ended up quickly checking him, doing a quick self-check, moving him over into the seat beside me, and then going, getting out of the rig and starting to go through and do my check. Um, partner was trapped in the vehicle, ended up taking them two hours, I believe was um, the time that I was told from one of the crews that were on scene. I ended up being uh, taken off a of scene relatively quickly, like within the first rig I was, I was taken off scene. But um, partner was trapped. The uh, the two um, two people in the truck in front of us weren't um, weren't hurt. They were they were fine. Uh, went between checking on my partner and my patient for it was roughly the 20, 25 minutes before any of the other rigs or any other first response showed up. Um, and then I ended up going with the patient that we had in the back and the first rig transported um, him the rest of the way to Camrose and offloaded the patient. I went and got assessed. Um, and at the point that I got to the hospital, my back had started to hurt. And from then I've continuously had um, some sort of back pain or ache, just irritated um, back muscles and spasms a lot since um the accident um i found out at, like two or three hours later when we were still in cameras before doing kind of a debrief and me heading back being driven back to provost um to to kind of gather up my stuff and go home because i was i was it was my last day on shift and they just they took me off for the rest of the day understandably and um with that went got my when we got to the station in Camrose, found out about the extrication pro process found out roughly about some of her injuries and then found out um that she was going to the u of a for treatment she's fine um like my partner's fine she's back working within the industry along anything that I've heard her from uh, what um, information that I've been given, everything's going um, in an upward direction for her. So definitely happy to see that, happy to hear that, and uh, really um, relieved that it's just like the lasting effects are more so on my side. Now, with that, uh, I ended up going through two years worth of two and a half years worth of treatment, um, which initially began with my back, uh, and that was almost a full year's worth of treatment. And then I started to discover some mental health issues as well, and really found stressors and indicators and and just triggers when I was at work and working. Um, and then after the initial year of trying to deal with my back, finally being approved and going through the treatment for my mental health, um, the issues that I'm, I'm still currently dealing with and honestly have, have get, gotten a hold of, but still struggling with, um, certain aspects of it. Um, and this was both, I spent 12, 11 weeks or yes, 11 weeks the first time and 10 weeks the second time for my uh, my treatment at the Millard Center in Edmonton, the, like the Workers' Compensation Board, Millard Center. All of this was put on by Workers' Compensation um, to then eventually be transitioned to um, a physician that deemed... Um, 
my overall uh, issue as general anxiety disorder, even though I haven't had any of the symptoms that I've had post-accident, pre-accident. So I don't understand. It was two and a half years on, uh, on the support and then dumped. But again, another video. There's a lot of details that would have to be uh, gone over for it to make any sense. I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, but throughout the process of the accident and the treatment center, initially I was prescribed um, Toradol and some heavy duty muscle relaxants. And I would find that they would take the edge off, but they wouldn't do enough for me to even be able to roll out of bed. Like I was stuck in bed for quite a few days after the accident. Like I was very uncomfortable and not in a very good space. And about a month after, or a month and a half, month, month and a half after my, the accident, um, girlfriend at the time decided that it was, uh, it was a good moment for us to go our separate ways. And, uh, Gave me the notice that she would like me out of the house and uh, somewhere else by the end of the weekend. By the well, by the weekend. So there's a phone call home and return to La Casa here. Definitely a fun way trying to move a house worth half of the house worth worth of stuff, as well as wine and all the other just ridiculousness with the injured back at that time. And I was still using the same medication that I was on prior. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't working. It wasn't taking the edge off. My back was constantly in pain, but they would do scans. They would check and they couldn't find anything. Couldn't find anything wrong with, with the back. Oh, it's just soft muscle. Oh, it's just soft tissue issue. And it's uh, just one of those ones where they're like, well, can't find anything, so let's see if we can do this. And constantly just keep me on the pain meds. And they weren't doing the trick. They just, they weren't, they were, the ones that would help enough were making me so, so intoxicated that I couldn't even comprehend what the fuck was going on. Like, really, I couldn't comprehend what the fuck was going on. Now, once the move and the transition back to Slave Lake happened, back home, was a lot closer with my brother at the time. So the ability to start inquiring and acquiring cannabis began to increase. And after smoking a couple of evenings, I would realize all of a sudden that I would feel better. My back wouldn't hurt. I would, it's not so much that it wouldn't hurt. It's that it would be, the pain would be present, but I wouldn't care that it's there. So I could go about and do things knowing that my back is sore, protecting it not oh not because with the painkillers it would numb everything so i would just go and do what i needed and then afterwards my back would be killing me where with the cannabis it's like your back sore idiot don't lift that thing that's too fucking heavy instead make three trips of lighter loads it'd be that approach and definitely more beneficial in that sense you guys honestly it's really is hugely beneficial on that pain management side because it would be not a distracted, it would be an alleviant. It would alleviate the worry of the pain with the sore stiffness being there. It's not painful, it's sore and stiff. I can work with sore and stiff. I can't work with pain. And I was a still able to be fully functioning, still able to have a conversation and be in the conversation, you guys. It's... It has a huge benefit for me along the pain management side of things. And then when I started to smoke, I would, the huge and initial benefit for me was sleep. It would allow me to sleep. It wouldn't necessarily allow me to have a, a standard sleeping rhythm, but I would sleep and I would sleep for a reasonable amount of time and I would be able to get semi comfortable when I slept as well. Now, the two sessions in the Millard for the 20 some weeks where I was sleeping in a hotel bed for five nights a week. 
or four nights a week, I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, that was beneficial for me. But again, you gotta you gotta kind of take your notches where you can. And another this honestly, you guys, if we were to go through the full details of everything, this would be multiple hour story. It really would be because it's it's years in the making, and it and I if you guys have an interest in it, let me know. We will start to develop kind of these story time um, backlogs that you guys know exactly how we got to where we are. But hitting kind of the the cliff notes version of it, it it took a long time for me to get my back to where it is right now, and I'm still having issues with it. These issues, you guys can just, they can range from that stiffness, the soreness along the muscles to, to full on spasms and cannabis helps me, helps me again, stay in that kind of mode of awareness, but kind of unconscious awareness to it. Okay. Well, let's just take care of it. Oh, you're sore. You're back stiff. Well, let's stretch it out. Let's see if that makes it feel better along those lines. It's more productive in that sense. Um, another big thing that I found after the accident was um, depressive and just no desire to get up and do anything. Where when I smoked, I found that I was very much internalizing my thought. Like I was very much thinking about myself. Like not in uh, uh, well, w taking care of me, but more so how can I work so that I don't need to take care of me, right? Like trying to self-improve, trying to, to build, well, what things are wrong? What things aren't working? Well, what, like a lot of, well, what, well, what, well, what? Well, this happened, why? Like a lot of that kind of self-questioning. And it was in probably one of the darkest times that I had that hit and it took a lot of me being by myself and thinking about myself and and. And finding things that I was either having issues dealing with and I needed to or I was just working on. The ability to not worry about anybody else and just focus on that. And now now that's transitioned to not having to focus on me but focus on my work. Like it allows me to be productive and really, really keyed in into what I'm doing. That's a huge benefit for me and that's a key reason why when I'm having days that are necessarily more mentally stressing or more mentally taxing, smoking a bowl, I'm allowed to focus. I can kind of drive in and get that honed in feeling. And the loss of the ability, not necessarily the full on loss, but just the difficulty that I've increased having those issues post the accident. And it was very much so it was, I was horrible for starting a thousand tasks and never following them through because it'd be, well, I got to start it, like it, I've got, there would be no deep in focus in something. It's like, well, we've got to get all this done. Well, let's start all of it and then come back and work on step two and do everything in a progress. And it became absolutely chaotic. Now it's very much start one thing, do it well, and then move on to the next and just go that way. Right. And cannabis is a huge benefit along those lines. Now into the, kind of the 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 rich, it since the accident I've I've been like the depressive natures and stuff like that. That's that's present. It's an issue. It it plays a factor. Like one day I can wake up be entirely inspired and really driven to get something done, and then the next day. It's not there. Like the desire to roll from my back to the left side in bed is not there. And when it was at its absolute worst, when I didn't have, when I haven't built up reasons to, or responsibilities for myself. And I was really just kind of floating around waiting for something to happen right after the accident it was at its worst and i and cannabis allowed me to just not worry about that so much so it 
it would just allow me to either get distracted by games or distracted by a show and it would just alleviate enough of the pain, not not necessarily pain but just the pressure that I felt and there's some days where I still need that I still have that but they're one in a hundred versus one in five and the added responsibility of these videos the channel the you the Instagram page doing the live streams all that stuff the more responsibility I pack onto myself the less I have the um, the need for that cannabis to go but and the be the need to use cannabis in that way but in the beginning where I really didn't have that that drive to it's like oh, okay well, let's just get this going I didn't have that cannabis was the thing for that well it's like oh it's just go and smoke you'll feel better afterwards where now it's like well if you just get up and record that you'll just feel better well if you just get up and start the live stream you'll feel better like that's the experience I have now where before the accomplishment of getting out of bed rolling a joint and going and smoking was what I needed but um with that you guys that's I I really don't know what else I can how else I can go into it it's cannabis has just kind of become a part of my life because it's allowed me to build up the responsibility upon myself and the enjoyment of honing the responsibility and the the tasks or whatever I am setting out for myself and completing it. Like this is the first time where it has been absolutely honest and just focus right in on one central project. And that's really why I smoke you guys. Cannabis has given me an inspiration to honestly be in. I was inspired before cannabis gives me a drive behind that inspiration because of the desire and the interest of the the plant and the the miraculous benefit that I have and the turnaround that I've had because I'm I'm I consider myself one of the lucky people who are able to control the the concerns that I have without the need of cannabis, it, it does make things a lot easier. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be one of those people who are just, I can do this without it. Mm, I would rather not. I can, but I would rather not. Because the enjoyment of my life would substantially, it, it would take quite a while for me to get back to where I am now. I could, but I don't want to, folks. And if something's working for you, what? And and there are are really no apparent or supported like deficits behind it. Why not, folks? Why not? But we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna wrap this one up. We're at forty minutes, you guys. I've been sitting here and talking for quite a while. You guys have gotten a little bit more of a backstory. You guys know a little bit more of kind of where my base of my knowledge comes from too because that's with the medical side of things it makes cannabis a lot easier to understand I'm finding because it's it's very similar to understanding medicinal and medical based effects with the pharma the, the pharmacodynamics and the, the actual pharmaceutical grade medicines where cannabis is just a natural great medicine you guys but um with that thank you again i really really can't say this enough thank you again for helping us hit 500 subs i can't believe it i can't wait for us to work our way up to a thousand like daryl said this morning on the live stream it's gonna happen quicker than i think i want i want to hit there before 2022 but um you guys you could make it happen before the summer but uh Again, thank you so much. And if you guys stuck around this long, please let me know down in the comments. I really do appreciate each and every one of you guys coming and checking out these videos and uh, coming and being involved in the community. Um, but uh, with that, 
We're going to wrap this one up. Hope you guys enjoyed. We will be back tomorrow with our weekly wrap up. I'm going to just quickly pound that out right now and um, get it such you guys don't miss a day of content this month. And then on Monday, we're going to dive into some Black Cherry Punch from Violet Tourist. Or Violet Tourist? Yeah. Damn sure it's called Violet Tourist. Yeah. The Violet Tourist Super Flower. Black Cherry Punch. We're going to dive into that, you guys. And then... Um, You'll get to find out about all the strains we are smoking after that review. But for the time being, see you in the next one. Cheers, you guys. Hope you enjoyed. End card slides in. Hover over the logo. Click that subscribe button and the bell notification so that you know anytime one of my videos go live. Down below, one's the most recommended video for you. The other one's the most recently uploaded. I'll see you in the next one.